Jesus' house. Hallelujah. Thank you. That means gifts of faith, gifts of healing, workings of miracles, tongues and interpretation, prophecy, discerning of spirits. Hallelujah. I thank you that great things are happening here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I thank you that this is a this is a place. This is a this is a this is a watering place. This is an oasis. This place, this house is an oasis in this community. Hallelujah. I thank you that people come from all around. Hallelujah to get wet. People come all around to get refreshed. People come from all around to, to hear the word. People come from all around to experience the presence of God and the power of God. Oh, we thank you for it, Father. Oh, we thank you for it, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you that this is an oasis. Hallelujah. This is a household of faith. This is a household of prayer. This is a household of power. This is a household where God is doing great things. Hallelujah. 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 You said you look throughout the whole earth looking for someone's heart that is turned towards you, perfect towards you. So, Lord, our heart is turned towards you. So I thank you that you are doing something in this house. You're doing something in this house. And I thank you that you are doing something right now. You are doing something right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to heaven and let's just, just worship. Worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Thank you, Lord. The word says that he, he, he looks for those, that he, he, he desires those that worship him in spirit and in truth. He's looking for those that worship him in spirit and truth, meaning, meaning he's looking for those that have their heart focused on him. Hallelujah. That are not holding anything back from him. Just, just lift your hands and worship. Just, just pray out of your own heart. Just worship out of your own heart. Just start thanking him for his goodness. Start thanking him for his faithfulness. Hallelujah. Release and worship out of your heart. Hallelujah. Release worship out of your heart. As you worship, it sets an atmosphere for the word to come forth. Hallelujah. We worship you tonight. Hallelujah. We worship you tonight. We bless you in this place tonight, Father. We bless you in this place. Hallelujah. I thank you, Father. We, we thank you. We count it an honor and privilege to hear your word. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. When I first moved here in 1999, and the Lord got me in a habit of, of doing something, and, I, and I, some of you have heard me say this before. And it started with when they were, did 30 Days of Glory out at EMIC. Um, I believe that started in 98, but I got to the one in, I think, 99. And th that first service that I sat in there, and the Lord had me do this, it, no matter who was speaking, what was taking place, the Lord always had me say this, Father, I count an honor and a privilege to hear the word. Say that. Father, I count it an honor and a privilege to hear your word. Say that after me. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. It is an honor to hear your word. I open my heart to receive your word. It will change me in Jesus' name. Amen. Stretch your hands towards Nikki. Father, we thank you for a word in season tonight. And, and Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that as she is anointed to, to minister the word, as she's anointed with the Holy Spirit in her and through her, I thank you, Father, we have the Holy Spirit in us. So that means not only do we, she has ears to, I mean, she has, she has lips to, and anointed to speak the word, but, Father, I thank you that we have anointed ears to hear the word. Thank you, Father, that we will hear and we will receive everything that we need to receive today. Lord, convict us where we need to be convicted. Inspire us where we need to be inspired. Father, but ultimately, Lord, our heart, Lord, is just what your word says, that we would be conformed to the image of his son. So that's our heart tonight. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give a hand to Nikki Deaton as she, as she brings forth the word. Thank you. Good evening. Oh, I'm loud. Is that better? All right. Well, we're talking about walking with God. And so I went to the Lord on my assignment on this, and he gave me um, eight little words. Sometimes powerful packages come, you know, powerful things come in little packages. 
So God can do a lot in little words. He told demons to go, one word, right? He said, Lazarus, come forth, three words. So tonight I have eight words, okay? So these words come from Amos 3.3, 3, which says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Have you ever seen a husband and wife not getting along? Not pretty, right? You can tell, you can always kind of tell when they're not getting along, when they don't agree. You know, in my house, you know, I give the look. Have any of you husbands ever got the look? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Well, this verse, can two walk together, um, walk together. Do I sound loud to you guys? Yeah, something behind me is really loud. Tinny, yeah. Walk together means united or as one. Can two be united unless they are agreed? An agreement, you know what that is, to be of one mind, to harmonize in opinion, right? Have you ever seen a mom try to get her kid out of the plane land in McDonald's yeah. when the kid is not in agreement? <laughs> yeah, again, not pretty, right? You can always tell. You know, that kid says, typically, I don't want to, right? I don't want to. Have you ever heard a little kid talking like that to their mama? Yeah. Um, have you ever heard an adult say that? <laughs> have you ever said that to God? You know, it's, he, you know, he says something like, forgive. I don't want to, you know, get over it. I don't want to, right? So just putting that out there. So I'm going to talk tonight. Um, you know, sometimes God will tell me simple things like, you know, he always talks to us about the things he wants us to do is for our benefit. How many of you know everything God tells us is for our benefit, right? So when he tells you to forgive, it's not for that other person, it's for you, right? When he tells you to rejoice, when you're tired, when you're angry, any of those kinds of things, you know? I remember a story of Smith Wigglesworth. He said he would get up in the morning and he wouldn't ask himself, Smith, how do you feel? He would just start dancing and singing to the Lord for 10 minutes. That's a long time. Have you ever danced by yourself in your bedroom for 10 minutes? <laughs> Me neither. It's a long time. It's a really long time. But sometimes God needs you to rejoice in the midst of something. You know, um, my son works, this wasn't in my notes, but my son works at the prayer line over at um, Eagle Mountain and um, for Kenneth Copeland Ministries. And one time, um, sometimes he, he does incoming calls for prayer, and then sometimes he calls partners to see how they're doing. So he had called this lady, and this lady, um, you know, she didn't want him calling her. You know, and he's, she's like, well, we're just checking in. And, well, I'm, our, I'm satisfied. I'm happy. I have a church. I don't need anyone checking on me, you know. And he's like, okay, ma'am, well, thank you. Have a very good night, you know. And he got off the phone, and then he just started laughing. You know, he just thought it was like, oh, my goodness, what do you do with that, you know, and he just laughed. Some people would get a phone call like that, and they would get, how rude. What a jerk. You know, you know what I'm saying? Some of us would respond like that in our not-so-good moments. And, um, well, what happened was he got, he got done laughing about this, and the lady across the aisle, another prayer minister, said, Drew, did you just get a call um, from a lady that wasn't very nice? And he was like, yeah, how'd you know? And he, she said, well, um, she just called back and wanted to apologize. She said she wasn't very nice. And she wanted you to know, she said, she told you she didn't need your call, but as soon as she hung up, the, her, the presence of God filled her room. Oh. And I told you, your laughing left the door open for God. Amen. Made room for God to continue doing what he needed to do. If he had gotten in strife about it or said, what a jerk, I, I'm convinced that that would not have happened. You know what I mean? So sometimes God needs us to do stuff that we don't really want to, we don't want to do, right? But can two walk together unless they are agreed? So first tonight, I want to talk about know who you're with. Know who you're with. You know, when, when the Holy Spirit spoke this to me, it was more like, know who you're with. Girl, you better know who you're with, you know, like that. You better know who you're with. Who are you agreeing with? Who are you agreeing with? Who do you believe? So first, let's start with Matthew 14. I like the Bible. Do you like the Bible? So we're going to read a bit of the Bible tonight. Matthew 14. You all know this story, so I'll read it to you. You might not need to turn there. It's Matthew 14, um, verses 28 through 31. It's Peter, Jesus walking on water, and then Peter walking on water, right? In verse 28, it says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. 
When Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So Jesus said, come. So Jesus, or Peter got out of the boat and came to Jesus, walking on water, walking with Jesus, right? We're talking about walking with God, walking with Jesus, walking like Jesus. Right. Would you agree? As long as his eyes were on Jesus and Jesus' word was above everything else, right. right? But when other things spoke louder than Jesus, he began to sink, right? right? Yeah. No more walking with Jesus, no more walking like Jesus, right, in that moment. So I use this just to say all of us want to walk with God. None of us would say we don't want to walk with God, right? We, we all, we're Christians, so obviously we want to walk with God. Right. So, but this serves an example that you don't always outright call God a liar. <laughs> it's not like Peter said, Jesus, you're a liar. I can't walk on water, right. Right? Right. right? Instead, he just listened to the things around him more than he listened to Jesus. Yeah. Jesus' voice became quieter, and he didn't give it the respect, maybe, that it deserved over, right, the voice of the wind, the voice of the waves, Right? So sometimes it's not like we would call God a liar. We wouldn't say, I disagree with you, God. I'm not walking with you. We don't come out and say things like that. But in actions, the Bible says we deny him. So I just want to bring that to our attention because I know that's not what we want. And it's not always people who contradict God. Sometimes it's situations, conditions, and still we have to choose who you're with. Who you with? Whose report will you believe? Remember that old song? Yeah. Whose report will you believe? Right. we, we got to think like that. You know, 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, cast down all imaginations. Any high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Right? right? we got to cast it down. we got to obe to the obedience of Christ. Right? right? We've got to obey Christ. And in my Bible in 2 Corinthians 10.5, when it refers to that word obedience, it says to listen with agreement. Yeah, that's, that's what that means. To listen with agreement. So when God speaks, you have to agree with him over everything else. Amen. No matter what report you get, if it's contrary to what God says about you, about your life with him, right. then you've got to go with God. Because who you with? Right? So we got to go with God. Remember, the devil's going to always attack the word. Yes. From the beginning, did God say? He always going to attack what God said. Always, always. Mark chapter 4, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, the parable of the sower. The devil comes to what? Steal the word. He's going to come to steal the word. If he can get you to listen to something other than the word, then he can stop its effect in your life. Right? So um, when I was reading through, um, I have it in my bag, but um, JSMI's 50th anniversary newsletter, little magazine, Adventures in Faith, Miss Carolyn had an article in there into which she listed five, I think, five traits that have helped them get to 50 years of ministry. And she used faith as an acronym. But the A of that, of that was attitude. She said attitude. She said, when our attitude is, I'm going to stick to the word of God no matter what, we won't be led astray and into error. So you've got to have an attitude that puts the word of God above everything else. She said that the dictionary definition of attitude is a settled way of thinking. So you've got to settle it in your mind who you're going to agree with. Who are you with? Who are you with? Who are you with? Who are you going to stand with? She said our attitude toward the word of God must be that it's the final authority in every area of our life. Not just how we worship on Sunday. Right? Not just um, how we act in church. It's how you act at home, how you walk on the job. It's, it has to be the final authority when you go in the doctor's office, when you go in the grocery store. You know, the word of God has to be how you, why you live the way you live, right? right? Um, let's see. She said in the Passion Translation for Psalm 1, 1 through 6, she said, those that delight in God's ways, their pleasure and passion. I like that. I like anything that has, like, passion. I'm a passionate person, right? She said that the Passion Translation says their pleasure and passion is remaining true to the word of I am. And I know that's where all of us want to be, right? So tonight is just kind of a reminder. Remember who you're with. Believe him above all else, right? His word is true. We can't be treating God like he's a liar. 
right? We would never call him a liar, right. so let's not treat him like a liar. Right. So according to Miss Carolyn, and I'm only quoting her, we need to have some attitude, right? right? right. We need to have some attitude where we're not going to listen to the devil, we're not going to fall for his schemes. You know, Matthew 24 says, they came to Jesus and they said, what's going to be the sign of the end times? His very first response was, take heed that no one deceive you. So if we know the word of God so well that we recognize counterfeits, you know what I mean? You won't fall for it. But you've got to have an attitude that says, a settled way of thinking that says, I'm sticking with the word of God no matter what. No matter what, no matter what, I'm sticking with God. Another word for agreement, and I know you'll recognize this too, is accord, right? We, we use that word accord and A-C-C-O-R-D. But when I think of it, I think of a cord, like, you know, tie somebody, right? Right, a cord. Um, have you ever done a three-legged race? <laughs> yeah, me too. I don't know how many of you know this, but I have an identical twin sister. So we rocked the three-legged race. <laughs> I mean, rocked it. When we got on summer breaks, we would, like, we, there, you know, there was always, like, field day at the end of the school year. Yeah. So when we, when we got on summer, we were already thinking about next year's field day. So we would, we would tie our own legs together in the backyard, and we would practice. We would run up and down picnic tables. We would climb, climb trees with our, with our legs tied together. We were masters at the three-legged race. I don't think anyone ever beat us. But a cord, it's what are you tied to? What are you tied to? Sometimes there's things in our life where we said, I don't care what anyone says, I'm not giving that up. That's what you're tied to. And, I don't, and that's fine. You answer for yourself. But are as you as, as tied to God, church attendance, the Ten Commandments, as you are that thing? That's all I'm saying. Is what are we tied to? Because we want to be tied to God. I want to be so close to him. Right? And isn't that all of our hearts and desires? We want to be so, we want to walk with him. Have the same passion he has. Right? And walk with him. So when we think about the word accord, it actually means unanimous, unanimous. It comes from a compound word meaning same passion. There's that word passion again, same passion. Isn't that what we want in the church? We want all of us to have the same passion. You know, when you, when you read that word accord, obviously most of you are probably gonna think Book of Acts, right? They were in one accord. How many times in the Book of Acts do they say that about the church, that they gathered in one accord? Over and over and over again, they use that in the Book of Acts. So it's a characteristic of the early church. Yeah. Well, let me remind you, the early church had a whole lot of miracles, right. whole lot of marvels, whole lot of wonders, right. whole lot of extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God, right? right? right. So, and it was about, and they were in accord. They had the same passion. Let me read you one verse where this is recorded. Acts chapter 2 verse 46 says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Amen, I'll take that. Favor with all people, right? And it says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's a pretty good verse. That's one I think we could all grab hold of, right? Well, let's break this verse down just a little. So continuing daily with one accord, so I told you that means unanimous, same passion, right? Every day, same passion. Breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness. Well, what does that mean? They're just happy? They're like, oh, yeah, it's time to eat, yay. No, not quite. That word gladness in the original Greek actually means jumping and gushing with joy unanimously all of them in one accord gushing and jumping with joy I want in on that party <laughs> I want to be where they are right that's where I want to be they ate their food with gladness jumping and gushing with joy and simplicity of heart now that means singleness of heart singleness of thought and emotion Amen. which means they had one thing on their mind God and what God was going to do. I mean, you know, that's just exciting. They had one, they just knew God was going to do great things. Every day, every day they were expecting. Every day, they didn't come to church and just think it was going to be, well, let's go do our time, like prison, right? <laughs> no, they came to church and they were gushing with joy, singleness of thought and emotion, praising God. Now, in the original Greek, that doesn't just mean singing. It means telling their God stories, boasting on God. Oh, come on. Yeah. 
Can you imagine being at house to house from day to day where you were with a group of people gushing with joy, boasting on God, telling their God stories? No wonder they showed up every day for that. And because of that, they had favor with all the people. Because who doesn't want to hear about that? Who doesn't want to hear that God is real, that he cares, and he can make a difference? Right? And I have proof, you know? I mean, that's what people want to hear having favor with all the people. So they got in accord with God's word. They got in accord who God said he was and what he was going to do. Amen? Amen. So we have to rejoice in this God we serve. Every day we got to get in accord with him and what he wants to do. So I know for me, at the start of this year, God gave me Psalm 145. (laughs) And Psalm 145 is one of those great chapters where you get up and you read it and it just lights your fire. So let me just read. I'll let you in on my morning devotional. Is that okay? Okay. I'm going to read it to you real quick. It says, so every morning I get up, almost every morning, and I read this chapter. I will extol you, my God, O King. Even those days where I don't feel like I'm going to have a good day or, Lord, is today going to be any different than yesterday? Right? I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation will praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. That's what I speak over. Us to our children, our children to, you know what I'm saying? One generation will praise your works to another. I don't care. I'm not moved by what I see. This is what the Bible says right? I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men will speak of the might of your awesome acts. Men are going to speak of the might of your awesome acts. And I will declare, I will declare your greatness. They will utter the memory of your great goodness and will sing of your righteousness. Now that's just one through seven and there's 21 verses like that, right? So when I get up and I speak those to myself and I say them out loud, That's what I expect that day. I expect his greatness. I expect that people are going to talk about it. I'm going to declare it. I'm going to have moments where he's going to work on my behalf and I'm going to have something to say. I'm going to boast on my God. So I expect those kinds of things. So know who you're with, right? Know who your God is. Know what you can expect. Know who you're with and agree with him, right? Agree with the word no matter what. Whatever the word says is final authority. And not just on the good but even over the stuff you don't want to do, right? right? Right. When he says, don't touch this, don't touch it. It's for your benefit that he says that. You know, get it out of your house. Get it out of your life because he's working on your behalf. What's well-pleasing in his sight. He's only got you in mind. That's That's it. All right. Number two, know who you're with. Know who you're with. So it's important to know. Remember when Trey got up and spoke the first week of this series, and he said that um, what cha- literally changed his life was finding out that God was good. Yeah. good. Right? Yeah. When you find out that God is good, you know who you're with, then that's what you can expect. Yeah. So no matter what happens, if you know he's good, then you have to go back to rule number one. Does that make sense? Yeah. So no matter how you feel about how things turned out, go back to rule number one. God is good, right? He's good. So you've got to get in agreement with that. You've got to make your, your mind line up no matter what else comes against you. You've got to let your mind line up with God is good. In fact, in Psalm 145, there's a verse that says, the Lord is good to all. Amen. So we've got to agree, right? We've got to go to the word and we've got to agree with it. So God is good. You have to start with know who you're with. So... Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. You probably all know this story too. It's not going to be probably new to most of you. But in John chapter 4, we have Jesus on a journey and he stops at a well. And and the disciples go into town and a woman comes to the well with a water pot. Jesus says to her in verse 7, give me a drink, right? And he's like, and she says, how is it that you being a Jew would ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritan. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Know who you're with, right? Know who you're with. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. 
Where then do you get that living water? Can't you almost hear the sarcasm in her voice? Okay, great, sir. Yeah, where's your bucket? Right? Like, yeah, you're going to get me a drink? You don't even have a pail. Right? So what's she saying? She, she, she says in verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? Like she's getting smart, right, with him. She has no idea who she's with. As well as his sons and his livestock, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman says to him, sir... Give me this water, right, that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. So what does she ask of Jesus? She asks for the living water. Look what Jesus says. Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said I have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. Now, it's a good thing the disciples are in town, because if the disciples were there, can't you just see one of them going, Jesus, 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 come here you going to really call her out like that? <laughs> right? Isn't that what some of you would be thinking? Yeah. yeah. It's like, G G Jesus, she's asking for living water. <laughs> and can't you just see Jesus saying, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she asked for living water, and what does he, he points out her problem. Yeah. Right? right. Yeah. So let's go on. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She's quick. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. <laughs> and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is a place where one ought to worship. Isn't it interesting that Jesus points out her problem and she all of a sudden rightly discerns she has a worship problem. Isn't it? Because all of our symptoms, all of our problems are just symptoms of a root issue. It's called the first commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul. Yeah. If we loved him with everything that we are, we wouldn't disobey his commandments, right? right? right. So she knew right away it was a worship issue, right? Good. So then, then he talks to her, right? He talks to her more about this. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you don't know. The hour is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. That means in reality. Yeah. you got to worship him in reality. It can't just be something you know about so you think you're doing. Right. You know what I mean? It's got to be something you're really actually doing and worship isn't just praising and singing you know we can't let worship become what we do at the beginning of a service on Sunday right. worship is treating God like he's God yeah. of your life all the time That's good. Yeah. right That's good. That's good. so then I think it's great that when the woman says to him um, she, she recognized him as Messiah and then it says that she at this point, the disciples come back. They marvel that he's talking with a woman. The woman then left her water pot and went into the city and told them all about him, right? So when, I'm reading, when I was reading this, getting ready for this, know who you're with. You know, sometimes <clears throat> she asks for living water. Jesus tells her her problem. She identifies it right away as a worship issue, Right? When he corrects that, when he finally says and gets it corrected that it's not about where you worship, it's about worshiping for real, right? right? Her thirst changes because all of a sudden she leaves the water pot, That's good. right? That's good. And so we can't be afraid to let the word correct us. You know, sometimes we think that the word that comes forth is um, because we, it makes us feel bad that that's condemnation. Well, there's something wrong with the word if it brings condemnation. No. The word, know who you're with. Right. The word is always good. It's always for your benefit. Yeah. If you're feeling condemnation, identify your enemy. Yes. Right? He's trying to get you to ignore and disregard the word. That's going to help you. Yeah. He's, Jesus is trying to get you living water right. by identifying your problem. Right? He's trying to help you. And so we can't get condemnation and conviction mi mixed up. Right? When we're convicted, we have to just be humbly enough to say, oh, I need to fix that. 
Remember Pastor Justin talked about humility last week? That's a huge, huge part of walking with God. It's a requirement to walking with God is that you walk humbly with God, right? That's what he requires. Because if you're not humble, God can't get things to you. You know, he can't change. Remember that attitude is a settled way of thinking? Sometimes we have settled ways of thinking that are contrary to the word. And so we have to be open to the word to change how we think. Because our thinking has to be renewed. It has to come in line with the word. Because he's trying to get you life. Remember, the word, does, the word never comes to condemn. Even if you feel bad, it's not to condemn you. It's only to help you. The word comes to bring life. Remember John 3, 17? God sent his son, the word, into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him, the word, right? In the beginning was the word, John 1, 4. In him was life. Life is always in the word. It's always in the word. If we can take in, grab hold of it, and let it fix things in our life, it will bring life to our life. You know, 1 Peter 1.23 says, having been born again by the incorruptible seed, the word of God, right? That word of God comes in, and it, we got born again. It totally changes things. It brings life every time. The word will bring you life. And let me just say, John 3.36 in the Amplified says this. And he who believes in the Son, the Word, right, has eternal life. But whoever disobeys is unbelieving toward, this is amplified, let me break it down for you. It says whoever disobeys the Son or the Word will never experience life. Yeah. That's Bible, I didn't say it, yeah. right? John three thirty six. okay? So it says, but whoever disobeys the Son or the Word will never experience life. Now let me give you what the Amplified says disobeys means. Is unbelieving toward, refuses to trust in, disregards, is not subject to. See, the word is always going to come to give you life. But if we disregard it, then we can't get life. And that's what we really want. Yeah. That's what we really want. You know, I, there's been times in my life where what I really want is peace. But I don't want to get over it. <laughs> so I got to decide which do I want more. Yeah. Right? Yeah. See, it, it, Jesus, you know, fasting is a good thing. Fasting is a good thing. How many of you believe fasting is a good thing? We should fast every once in a while. You know, get your flesh under control just, just so that you know that you don't have to drink coffee or eat candy. You have control. The candy doesn't have control over you. Speaking to myself. Right? And fasting is good, but God wants a fasted life. Yes. Yes. He wants a fasted life. And in a fasted life, you have to ask yourself constantly, what do I want more? What do I want more? Do I, do I want to hold on to this, or do I really want what God's offering me? And so we all have to, like, answer that question. What do you want more? What do you want more? Too often, <laughs> we don't want what he has to give us as much as we want our own way. Right? There's times that all of us have been through where we've been angry and we didn't want to stop being angry. We were hurting. We didn't want to stop hurting. Let me tell you, if you hurt long enough, that hurt becomes like a friend, yeah. like an old friend. And you don't, really, you, don't reckon, you don't know what life is like without that friend. So you don't want to give up that friend. Right? Yeah, yeah grieving can become like that. It can become an old friend. Yeah. It's right there on your shoulder and you don't recognize what life will look like without that. It's almost like you're afraid to give it up. I've been there, right? Like there's just any sin in your life that becomes controlling, you know? You don't know if you can do it without it. It's all very scary, but God's trying to give you life, right? And the great news about it is that once you get the word on it and you choose to believe the word on it, the Bible says, John 8, 32, you, believe, you know the word and the word will set you free. Yes. And then once, once you know the word and you believe, you choose to believe that word and it sets you free, then you have Isaiah 10, 27. It says that the anointing will come and break the yoke off your shoulder. And in the Amplified, it says that and your, your neck will get fat and it will never fit again. That's good. So that thing that gets broken, the devil will never fool you with again. Amen. Right? Once you get it taken care of. So that's the great news about it, right? Oh, my goodness, I'm at the end of my notes. All right. So know who you're with. Know 
who you're with, right? Now turn to John 2. I'm going to get all the way through my notes. I'm so excited. (laughs) John chapter 2. This is a story of Jesus turning the water to wine, right? And you've all heard it. And so they run out of wine, and the mother of Jesus says to him, they have no wine. Jesus says to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Jesus is the word. Whatever the word says to you to do, do it. Please do it. It's for your benefit, right? Whatever he says to do, do it. Whatever we... We've got to know this, this book, forwards and backwards. There's so many things in here for us that are for our benefit, but if we don't even know about it, we're going to live like everyone else lives. We're going to have the same problems they're going to have. we got to know what the Word says to do so we can do it and prove to them the perfect will of God. Amen. Right? Amen. All right, turn to Matthew 9. Matthew 9. I love Matthew's account of this story. Verse 18. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him and so did his disciples. And then you know the woman with the issue of blood interrupts, right? So this is Jairus. He's Jairus, story of Jairus' daughter, right? So Jesus handles the lady with the issue of blood. And then in verse 23, it says, When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, right, all the grievers, right, he said to them, Make room, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, see what happens to people who ridicule the word? Put outside. (laughs) Put outside. He went in and took her, and they don't even get to see the miracle. I mean, you know what I mean? They could have been like, oh, wow, it's miracle time. I want to watch. But no, they just laughed at him, right? Scorned him. Let scorning not happen in the church. You know what I mean? So he went in, took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went out into all the land. Nikki, why are you reading us this story? Look what Jesus said in verse 24. Make room. For the girl is not dead but sleeping. Like literally make room? Like, everybody spread out, spread out, spread out. No, that's not what he was saying. That's not what he was saying. This, room, this word, make room, means give place. Right? Make space for. See, sometimes in our minds, we have to change the way we think. We have to say, okay, this doesn't make any sense, but God, I'm making room. I don't know how you're going to do it, but your word says you will, so I just give you space. Right? Give him space in your mind that he can do something about this. Even though you have no idea how, no idea when, no idea anything, right? you got to make room for him. So, you know, as we're going through all this stuff, if if we understand who we're with, if we understand what the word says, and we understand that it's always good, it's always for us, always go back to that, then we got to make room for what he says. Make room for it because making room, making space, you know, when he said, in the other accounts of the story, do not fear, only believe. I mean, remember Jairus comes to him, like Matthew says, you know, that the girl was dead, but when he first came to him, according to the other accounts, she was sick, and he wanted her to come lay hands on her so she wouldn't die. And on the way, he gets the report that she dies, right? Jesus turns to him and says, do not fear, only believe. What was Jesus saying? Make room. Halt your thoughts. Just stay in faith. Just keep believing. Don't let those thoughts in. Remember, casting down every thought, every high thing that exalts itself against God's. You got to cast it down and you got to make room for what God can do, right? So here we are, right? This year we're believing for marvels, wonders, extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. We're going to have to make some room. We're going to have to make room for that. So we got to change the way we think. No matter what we see, we got to hear what God is saying in any given situation, and we've got to make him, give him room. So with that said, I want to just say, too, that if you can give God room, then you can probably give the enemy room, right? Remember that verse in the Bible that says, give no place? 
to the enemy, give no place to him. Remember, he's going to come, he comes only to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. So every tactic he has is to steal, kill, and destroy. So, you know, when you're, you know, sometimes people think that they, they have to add things to their life to get to where they can be, you know, miracle workers. You know, we got to add. And yeah, you got to have the word. Because Jesus said, do not fear, only believe, right? So you've got to believe the word. You've got to have what God says on a situation, right, for miracles. But so many people, they think they got, they got to add things to their life, but water doesn't usually add. Water cleanses. So typically what it's going to come to do is take things out of your life. Does that make sense? So we've got to get to a place where we're willing to get rid of some things where maybe, you know, um, can I just say some things tonight? Is that, is that all right? You know, it's time to stop tiptoeing with devil stuff. Give him no place, the Bible says. So get stuff out of your house that's from the kingdom of darkness. You know what I'm saying? Whatever that may be, what are you watching? What are you reading? What are you, you know what I'm saying? When you know who you're, you've got to know who you're with, you've got to choose a side. Right? right? And so it's like there's a gang war going on. So pick a side. Yeah. You know, there's colors, right, involved, right? There's light and darkness, right? And we don't wear their uniform. We don't fight like they fight. We don't, right? We don't use their weapons, right? So we don't listen to their programming. Why would you want to hear their words? I mean, would you turn on the radio and listen to a communist broadcast? No, why? Right? Right. You wouldn't, you wouldn't let that seed in. So don't let seed of the enemy in. You know what I mean? So when the, wa- the water comes in, it's, it's washing. It's wa- the washing of the water of the word. So whatever the word says to do, do it. Amen? Know who you're with, know who you're with, and whatever the word says to do, do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go ahead. (laughs) So who you with? (laughs) Who you walking with? Amen. Great word, Nikki. Great word. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for that word. We receive that word. Hallelujah. And Father, we just analyze our own lives and our own hearts and ask, who have we been walking with? Have we been trying to walk on two sides, the top of a fence, so to speak? And, but Lord, just show us to make room. Make room for the word. Make room for the word that's good. Lord, we humble ourselves under the word. And, Lord, we allow that word to shape us, to change us, to mold us, and make us into the person that you desire each one of us to be. Father, we do thank you for marvels and wonders and extraordinary manifestations. And, and we, receive, we receive this word tonight. Thank you, Father, for this journey of walking with you, learning what it means to walk with you and to grow with you. We thank you for it tonight, and we receive that word in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We ready to give tonight? Amen. Um, in Ephesians chapter 1, as you're preparing to give, you know, the different ways to give, whether it's text to give, the envelope, and the seat back, or online. But Ephesians 1, the Amplified, verse 6, it says, So that we might be to the praise and the commendation of his glorious grace, his favor and mercy, which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption, deliverance, and salvation through his blood. Man, can you praise God for that? Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. That in him we have redemption. Through his blood, the remission, the forgiveness of our offenses, shortcomings, and trespasses in accordance with the riches and the generosity of his gracious favor. So all these things that we have received redemption all came by, it says, the riches and the generosity of his gracious favor. So I'm a partaker of salvation because of his of his riches, of the generosity of his gracious. He so freely poured out something. He so fl- freely gave something, right? Then get this next verse. Which he lavished upon us. So this great, the riches 
in the generosity of his gracious favor, which says, which he lavished upon us. You just kind of get a picture of this, that, that he has this, this, this container of grace water, <laughs> this generosity of his favor, and he just pours this all over the top of your head. He just lavishes this over top of you. He, he pours this gracious favor over you. That's, that's what he did when he sent Jesus to you, that he poured this gracious favor over you, which he lavished upon us in every, now get this, in every kind of wisdom and understanding. So, okay, now this grace that we've received brought redemption, brought forgiveness of sin, but then he said this ge same generosity that was poured on us was for every kind of wisdom and understanding. You have to understand that, that the, the word that, that even like what Nikki was talking about, the principles in this word work. His word is good. And so part of his gracious favor that is poured on us is for us to have the ability to walk in the word. So this lavish grace that he poured out on us in every kind of wisdom and understanding. You know what? It takes true, because you know what? The outside world doesn't understand giving and receiving financially. They, you know, if you talk to someone just every day, you, you just inter interview someone on the street and, and you say, hey, do you give, do you give 10% of your, your, your earnings to, to, a, to back to your work? What do you do? <laughs> You could be crazy. I mean, people that, now think about it. You know, people like in the world don't understand. You give how much to the church? You give what to the church? Why? Because understanding that, that, that it, is a, it is a grace, it is a favor that's been poured out in, in its wisdom and understanding to know that his, his ability is working in my life. Not just for salvation, but his ability is working in my finances. But see, this grace is for us to operate. Now, I want, I want you just to follow up scripture with that to show you that giving is a grace. You know, in 2 Corinthians 8, he says that we come behind in this grace, also in this grace of giving. But in 2 Corinthians 9, verse, verse 1, it says, ver, I'm sorry, verse 6 says, But this I say, he which sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He which sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give. Not grubbing a, a necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And get this, and God is able to make all, what, grace? Abound towards you that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound in every good work. Then it says this, as it is written, he had dispersed abroad, he had given to the poor, and his righteousness remained forever. Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both ministers bread for your food and multiplies your seed sown. So understanding that he lavished this riches of his favor on us, and it says that same grace is wisdom and understanding. So you and I, as believers, we operate in a grace of giving. We bring ourselves under the grace of giving. If, if, if giving is, is something that is a work to you and it's something that's difficult, you're trying to do it in yourself. You're trying to do it in your own ability. You're trying to work it up up here. No, it is a grace that you operate in. It is a grace that he's poured out on you. And it says that it abounds to every good work. Amen. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to give into your kingdom tonight. And we just thank you for the riches of your grace that you have poured out in our lives and that, that in the form of wisdom and understanding. And so, Lord, I just thank you that each one of us, we have wisdom in our finances. We have understanding of the seed, time, and harvest principles. We receive that wisdom in, in, in the area of giving. We receive that understanding. And how to walk at another level of, of flourishing, another level of thriving, another level of, uh, of increase, Father. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's, let's water our seed tonight. Let's say these together. Everyone stand to your feet. Genesis 8, 22, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Therefore, I sow my seeds in faith, knowing that the law of seed time and harvest is working on my behalf. Genesis 1, 11, 
And God said, let the earth bring forth after his kind, and it was so. Therefore, I have sown my financial seeds, and I'm expecting them to produce after their kind in the form of financial harvest. Mark 4, 26 and 27. So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed in the ground, and the seed should spring and grow up. Therefore, I'm expecting every seed that I have sown to grow and to spring up and to produce an abundant harvest. Job 36, 11, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Therefore, because I have been obedient to God and have sown my seeds, I fully expect my days to be filled with prosperity and my years with pleasures. Second Chronicles 20, 20, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, and so shall you prosper. Therefore, since I do believe in the Lord my God, and I believe what his prophets have spoken regarding 2019 being our year for the abundant harvest, I'm expecting this each and every day throughout this year to come to pass in my life. In Jesus' name, so be it. Amen. Hallelujah. Ushers, you can receive the offering. You can be seated just for a moment while... Uh, while they were passing the containers. Amen. Uh, a few announcements. This Sunday, uh, March 31st, uh, 8.15 and 11.15, uh, they're doing a dessert auction. It's for our children's camp, so I encourage you to be a part of that and, and help, our, help our, uh, our kids go to camp. Uh, also, this coming Monday, April 1st, will be the Heritage Women's Outreach. And, and so if you want to go on that and you haven't res, uh, uh, registered for that online, make sure you go to our website under heritageoffaith.com backslash events, and you can, uh, you can uh, register for a slot for that. And they'll be meeting at the church, at, uh, leaving at the church at 530. Uh, so space is limited, so sign up online. If you haven't gone to that, I encourage you to be a part of that, going to the Crisis Center. It's such a great opportunity uh, to minister life in, into, into ladies' lives that need it. Amen. Also, next Sunday, we'll have, um, some of you know him as Captain Rex, um, but he won't be Captain Rex next week. He'll be Brandon Sanders, um, and so uh, he probably won't talk in his pirate voice, but, uh, but he'll be ministering next week on, uh, on walking with God, and so I encourage you to uh, be out here for that um, next Wednesday. Uh, also, the following Thursday, uh, the 4th, will be our next Heritage Men's uh, Bible Study, and that is the first Thursday of every month, and so I encourage you, all the men, if you haven't been to one of those, come out to that. It's a great time to connect with other men and go to the next level in your life and, and just to, and to challenge each other and to grow. And we, this year, our mandate is to, to grow in, in excellence and, and really bring out the minister that's on the inside of each one of us as men. And also, don't forget about um, voting. The deadline to reg register uh, for, to vote is April 4th, and we have the mayor and city council seats in the Fort Worth area. Uh, that, that voting is on May 4th. I encourage you, don't, just because it's a small election, it's, it's very important. You know, as I said, there's a lot of laws that get passed in city council meetings um, that you never knew were actually laws. And we actually have a team, we call it the Ezra team, and we have a team that actually are at all the city council meetings that sit in and, and kind of make sure that our voice is heard uh, as it pertains to this city. So, so make sure you, you know who's running, what's going on in, within your community. And um, I believe that's it. Everyone stand to your feet. Man, thank you, Nikki, for that, for that word tonight. So good, so good. You know, um, this Sunday we'll be continue, I'll be continuing to talk about in the name, and we'll continue to talk about honoring the name, what that, what that name is, and, and what it means to our lives. Other than that, we love you all. God bless. Have a great rest of the week. We'll see you Sunday.